I'm Stephanie, and I'm here with E. Uh, we're both software engineers at AnyScale, and together we'll present how Ray internally manages objects using the ownership model. Ownership is the basis of the Ray architecture today, but that wasn't always the case. So I'll first explain what ownership is and why we decided to redesign Ray in version 1.0 around this concept. After that, E will present some future and ongoing work on extensions to the ownership model. So first, I want to give some background for why we wanted to introduce ownership in Ray. The two main reasons were system stability and performance. And to show why these are important, let's take a look at model serving as an example use case. We can implement this in Ray by using multiple actors as model replicas and a router actor that routes requests to the models. Let's say this is an image classification pipeline. We can serve requests by having the router send each request to an appropriate model replica, and the clients will then send the image data to this replica. There are a few aspects of this that make it difficult to support. First, tasks are dynamically generated by clients, so we can't predict when they'll happen. Also, the tasks here can be very short in only tens of milliseconds, so the system overhead has to be very low. And finally, performance here may depend on moving data efficiently. One way to send the images to the model is to pass them directly through the router, but that would make the router a bottleneck since the images can be pretty large. We can see that bottleneck here in this approach that I call pass by value. This is a CDF of request latency, and the upward slope shows that there are too many requests for the router to handle. If you've used Ray before, you know that you can avoid these expensive copies by passing an object ref instead, and that's like passing a pointer instead of the value. Now the router might not be a bottleneck, but a naive system design can still add a lot of overhead. And for example, a centralized scheduler can be a bottleneck for the application. We can see that here with a modified version of Ray, where all object refs and tasks in the cluster are managed by a centralized process. So this is the basic motivation behind ownership. You can think of it as a way to decentralize the system for better performance, but without sacrificing other guarantees like reliability and fault tolerance. And you can see that here, where the solid green curve is Ray version 1.0. In the rest of this talk, I'll explain how we achieve this with ownership. But first, let's talk a little bit more about object refs. Object refs are one of the main primitives in Ray, and understanding what's special about them is critical to understanding ownership. The key idea behind an object ref is that they act as both a reference to distributed memory and as a future. I'll explain what that means next. As a point of contrast, let's look at the RPC model. I'll walk through a simple RPC program execution on three distributed processes. So we have a driver that invokes the RPCs and two stateless workers that can execute the requests, which I'll call tasks. We'll begin by sending an F task to worker one and once the worker finishes the task, it sends back the return value. We do the same to compute O2, and then finally we can send the values back to worker two to compute their sum. So obviously this is a really naive way to execute the program, and we're not really taking advantage of the workers at all. The two problems are that there's a lot of unnecessary data movement going on, and there's no parallelism in the execution. Object refs allow Ray to manage these functionalities on behalf of the application. First, let's look at data movement. The main issue before was that we had to copy O1 and O2 back to the caller just so that they could be copied into the add RPC. And this can get very expensive if O1 and O2 are large, so many systems get around this by using distributed memory. After executing the first task, instead of sending O1 back to the caller, we can actually just store O1 in memory on the remote node before replying. And we can do the same thing for O2, so now when we call the add RPC, we can pass the objects by reference instead of by value. So the add RPC still has to fetch O1, but we were able to save a lot of data copies because the caller doesn't have to keep all of the data local. Ideally, we also want the two F tasks to execute in parallel. Many RPC systems support this with futures so that another function can be invoked while a previous result is still pending. In our example, instead of having to wait for the first task to finish, 
the caller will immediately get back a future that it can use later on to get the value of 01. In the meantime, the caller submits the other F task, which the system can now execute in parallel with the first. And the caller can also pass the return futures into the add task before 01 and 02 have even been computed. Then, as soon as the values are ready, the system will send the downstream task. Object refs combine these two ideas, so now we can execute tasks in parallel and the return futures also act as references to distributed memory. Meanwhile, Ray can manage data movement and parallelism for the application. By making the values in distributed memory immutable, we can keep the same semantics as RPC, but support a wider variety of applications. For example, in model serving, we can use object refs to avoid copying large data through the router. We can also use object refs to make multiple requests in parallel, since each object ref is also a future. Object refs make it possible for Ray to provide high performance for the application, but there's a lot more to it than that. So let's take a look at the requirements and challenges for building a system like Ray. Now, the goal of Ray is to efficiently support applications that dynamically generate many short tasks, which might run in milliseconds. And the reason for that is generality. As an analogy, we can look again to the RPC model. For example, the popular gRPC framework is practical for so many applications because of its low overhead and its ability to execute millions of tasks per second. So the question that we study here is whether we can do the same for object refs and how we can still achieve fault tolerance in doing so. To see why this is difficult, let's consider the example from earlier where we had a driver that submitted to F tasks then passed their results to an add task. The fundamental problem is that a single value can now be shared by multiple processes. Take O1, for example. This object is referred to by several processes, the driver that specifies how to create and use it, the worker that creates the value, the worker that uses the value, and the physical location of the value. And all of these may be distinct and distributed processes. So if we want to ensure that a reference holder can dereference the value, we need to coordinate these processes. To make this concrete, let's think about the requirements for dereferencing a value. At minimum, we need to know where a value is located and whether it's still referenced. Of course, failures complicate things. So we also need to be able to detect a failure, which means that we need to record the location of a task before it starts executing. That way, if a worker dies, we can determine if there were any pending tasks on that worker that need to be re-executed. Second, we need to record each object's lineage, or the tasks that we executed to create the object. Similar to existing systems, we can then re-execute this lineage upon a failure to recreate the object. And finally, Ray itself has to be fault tolerant, meaning that all of this information must be able to survive failures. Of course, the main challenge is doing all of this without sacrificing latency and throughput. One option that I mentioned earlier is to use a centralized master, which is used by systems like Dask and an Apache Spark. We can have one process manage all object refs, so to execute a task, the driver first sends it to the master, which then sends it to the right worker. And this makes things like failure handling really simple, but as we saw earlier, performance suffers because we have to send all tasks through the master. Another option is to use a more decentralized approach, which is actually what we did in Ray up to version 0.8. The idea here was to have the driver send tasks to workers directly, avoiding that extra message to a centralized master on the critical path of execution. But then we would need some way to do things like detect failures. So to handle that, each worker would acquire a lease for tasks that it was executing, and the lease would expire if the worker failed. That way, another worker could detect the failure of a task. So even though there was still a centralized lease manager, this design meant that it was no longer a bottleneck in the system. But on the other hand, things like failures and memory safety were a lot harder to get right because they required workers to coordinate. And that brings us to ownership, which is a method of decentralizing the system without complicating coordination. Our key insight is that coordination is only expensive in existing solutions because they don't take advantage of the inherent structure of a Ray application. First, Ray task graphs are inherently hierarchical. In our earlier example, the program itself could have been invoked by a different task, and these function invocations naturally form a tree. 
Second, although passing an object ref creates shared state between processes, in most cases, the scope is actually limited to passing downwards through the tree. So in our example, the driver only passes O1 and O2 in its local scope, meaning that its parent never actually sees these values. So by exploiting the inherent application structure, we can actually decentralize Ray without having to coordinate between all of the processes. We just need to coordinate between the processes that actually share state. In contrast, a centralized master takes the extreme approach of centralizing all system state in one place, no matter which worker created it or which worker will need it in the future. So the idea behind ownership is to shard the master across the workers, which are the processes that actually create and share object refs. When a worker invokes a task, it owns the returned object ref and essentially acts as a master for just that object. But unlike a completely centralized master, the runtime overhead is low because we can keep all of the metadata local to the worker that's most likely to use the object ref. And we can also scale the system by using nested function calls in the application instead of sharding the master with an application agnostic approach like consistent hashing. Of course, the main challenge is in keeping system operations as simple as if there were only one master. And these operations include failure recovery, especially if an owner dies, and memory safety. In this talk, I'll focus just on failure recovery. And let's take a look at how this works. Here we have several worker nodes that each host an object store, and the system metadata will be stored at the workers. We'll use an example where we have task A that submits task B and then passes the returned object ref to task C. To schedule B, the owner first writes the future location of the task before sending B to node 2 for execution. Once B finishes, it stores the return value in distributed memory and then responds to X's owner. Next, we schedule C onto worker 3. And since C has a reference to B's return value, it also receives the address of X's owner. Now let's say that there's a failure while worker 3 is trying to dereference X. We'll leave it to X's owner to detect the failure and to recover the object by re-executing the object's lineage. Of course, we also need to handle the case where X's owner fails while worker 3 is trying to dereference X. So the main challenge here is that we've now lost all of the system metadata that was on worker 1, so somehow we need to recover it and finish executing C. To ensure, to ensure progress, we first clean up all of the state related to X by using the cached owner address to detect the failure. And then we can rely on the hierarchical nature of the application. So A's owner will eventually resubmit A, which in turn resubmits B and C. So we trade off some persistence here, but in exchange we get simplicity and lower runtime overhead. And importantly, we don't sacrifice correctness. So next, I'll hand it over to E, who will explain some of the limitations of this approach and what we can do to address them. Thanks, Stephanie, for the great talk about the ownership model. Here, I will talk about ownership transfer and how does it address the limitations of the ownership model. In the ownership model, whoever creates an object uh, owns the metadata. As Stephanie mentioned, there are a lot of benefits from this like it guarantees consistency and low latency. It decentralizes the system according to the application structure, and they can use the lineage's construction to recover from failures. But there are also some limitations, like lineage's construction can be applied to all scenarios, and objects is fit sharing with their owner. We will go deep into the second limitation in the rest of this talk. Usually, this is fine if we only pass the object downwards. But the question is, what if they are not? What if there are other patterns? Ownership transfer is trying to address the second limitation by introducing transfer the ownership from one worker to another. In this session, we will go through why this is important by identifying the other patterns for object passing first. And then we will go through some real-world use cases. In the last part, we will review the design. So why do we need ownership transfer? As mentioned, 
Here we have one assumption about our model that is object reference is passed downwards. Let's do a quick recap here. Suppose in the driver, we call a remote function f, and the return is x. Here, the owner of x will be the driver. Then the driver passed x to the remote function g. Now let's check what's going to happen if some worker failed. What if the worker run f failed? This is fine. Since x is owned by the driver, and G can still access X even the worker run F failed. Then, what if the driver exits? In this case, G won't be able to access X anymore, but it's also okay since the worker run G will be killed after the driver died. This is downward passing pattern, where the object is passed from the owner downward to the other functions. But what if the assumption is broken? Let's check another piece of code. Suppose we have a remote function f. Inside f, it puts an object into object store and returns a list of object reference to the corner. The driver calls the remote function first, and then the worker will create x and return a list containing x. Here, x is owned by the worker where f scheduled, and the driver only owns the outer list. Then, the driver tries to access the inner element of the list. Let's recheck the previous two questions. What if the worker failed? Driver will fail to access X since the owner died. And what's worse? We have no way to reconstruct it since the lineage information is stored in the owner. In this case, it's not OK. What if the driver access? It's OK for this case, since there is no place where access X anymore. We call this upward pattern, since it's passing the object from the owner to the caller. Now let's check another piece of code. The driver first calls the mode function F to get object X, and now X is owned by the driver. Then the driver created a detached actor. Detached actor is an actor that will still alive even the driver exits. Then the driver passes a list containing x to a detached actor. Let's recheck the previous two questions. What if the worker failed? It's OK, since the driver now is the owner of x, and the function g still can access x, just like downwards pass pattern. What if the driver exits? The actor won't be able to access x anymore, since the owner exits x cannot be constructed due to the owner died. So it's not OK here. We call this lateral passing pattern, since it's passing object across different ownership trees. Now we have checked the three patterns of object passing, and two of them need the support of ownership transfer to work safely. Next, let's check some real-world use cases. But first, maybe let's think about why we need to take care of these cases. Or to an answer another question, what will happen if we don't take care of these cases? Scale down a cluster will be hard, even if there is no task running, because it might have the owner of some objects there. And if we remove that node, we will no longer be able to access these objects. We also want to be able to remove the zombie process. For example, we cannot access driver or any worker which are the owner of some objects that are still in use. So these workers are just there, but doing nothing, like zombie process. And we want to be able to reconstruct the objects if the owner died. Here is a real-world example in VDP. Right now, uh, they pass the list of data, data partition upward to the corner. If the worker died, there is no way to get the data. Here's another example. The tensor object is put into object store first, and then the list of object reference are stored in the detached actor. If the worker exits, then these cached objects are no longer able to be retrieved. Next, let's take a look at the designs. 
To resolve this problem, we need to answer two questions. When should we do and uh, how can we transfer the ownership? To answer the first one, we need to figure out what's the best way to trigger a transfer. To answer the second one, we need to figure out how can we transfer an object from one owner to another owner. We need the solution to be easy to use, which means that it should be user-friendly. We also need it to be efficient and doesn't add a lot of overhead to the system. We want the solution to cover the most of the real-world use cases. Let's first try to answer the first question, when to trigger a transfer. One way is to introduce a new API to trigger the transfer manually. For example, some API like move to, which will move the ownership of an object to another worker. This is simple to implement and very efficient, but this is not very good to the user, since the user needs to think carefully about the ownership of the objects and we also need to update the code to do this. Another way is to transfer by deleting, uh, detecting the scope changes automatically. This can provide the best of the user experience and the user don't need to think about the ownership explicitly since the algorithm will cover it for them. But how to do the detection here? Upward transfer is relatively easy to do since we only need to transfer the owner of objects to the corner. For the lateral transfer, it's more complicated, but we can at least easily support transferring between detached actors, which can cover a lot of use cases. The ideal solution is to do transfer if the receiver and the owner of the objects are in different ownership scope, which is harder to do. Another question is how to transfer. Let's review the example in the lateral passing pattern. It should be the same for upward passing pattern. In driver, we first call a remote function to get x, and then create a detached actor and pass x to the detached actor. How about the ownership of x? The driver owns x, and x won't be available if the driver exists. One way to do uh, this is by ownership sharing. We can implement the sharing in reference counting layer so that the object can be owned by multiple workers. And in this way, we transfer the ownership to each of the worker. Here, the driver and the actor both will own the object X. The object X will be cleaned up when it's not owned by any workers. This is relatively simple to implement since most of the changes will be in reference counting layer. And it's relatively efficient since it behaves like a logic copy of the underlying objects. So we don't duplicate the physical copy of the objects. Here is just a, a quick recap. We went through the three patterns of object passing and uh, discussed why we need ownership transfer. Later, we went through one design. We will transfer the ownership automatically via pattern detecting and uh, share the ownership among all the workers which is using this object. Since this is an ongoing project, we are looking for feedback. And so that concludes our talk on ownership. Please check out our white paper for more information about ownership model and how it relates to other problems such as memory management. Thank you, and we are happy to take any questions.